We continue the scene setting in this second episode of At the Edge of the World. Last week, we noted that in 1086, England's first Norman king, William the Conqueror, who'd reigned 20 years since his victory at the Battle of Hastings, had made a survey of his Kingdom of England called Doomsday Book, which was intended to tell him everything about his people, their number, wealth, agriculture, business, name of Lord of the Manor, down to the smallest village, the last pig, the last eel. We also discovered from the work of Mrs. Jane Cox at the National Archives that some species of flora and fauna that we take for granted were absent in Norman England. Here are some more absentees. There were no blackbirds, delphiniums, marigolds, laburnum, those gorgeous voluptuous effulgences of yellow flowers that tell us that spring has really arrived. There was no lavender or rosemary. Tobacco and drugs, including recreational drugs like marijuana and cocaine, were not available in Europe until the 16th century. There was alcohol. There was little conception of medicine and medical practice after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West in the 5th century AD, and the revival of Greco-Roman medical knowledge by the Muslims in the Middle East, North Africa and Spain from the 8th century was either unknown or ignored in Western Europe even thought wrong by some men in the church who saw physical afflictions as divine punishment or as a test of their faith. Indeed, the whole of earthly life was a trial in preparation for the afterlife, and the brickbats of the here and now were to be born with equanimity. Priests, monks and nuns sometimes wore hair shirts, undertook self-flagellation or became hermits living in the wild on acorns by one account, their lives given to contemplation, prayer, and the mortification of the flesh. Some hermits came together in groups from which a religious foundation might evolve, and this is where we get the word hermitage. I wonder whether the folk who today own or stay in hotels and restaurants called the something hermitage, a swanky sort of name, know just what they are harking back to. Perhaps they do. Tease maids in the bedroom and amateur, inattentive, acne-faced waiters in the dining room are the less attractive modern equivalents of the hermit's cauldron of long-simmered soup made from root vegetables he or she had collected. People knew that diseases, especially diseases like the plague, spread, but they had little idea of how to deal with it other than to try to keep out of an area and burn the bodies after death. There was no conception of infection from water unless it smelt or looked particularly unpleasant, or from cuts. Really quite small cuts could, and usually did, kill you. The idea of boiling water or sterilizing knives in scalding water was only realized in the early 19th century. In his memoirs, the Duc de Saint-Simon, writing about the court of Louis XIV of Versailles, that center of Western civility in the later 17th century, mentions that surgeons cleaned their instruments once a month. We might wonder why they bothered at all. It is very hard to know what life expectancy was in Britain in these centuries. The common people, as the masses were routinely described by chroniclers, were of no interest other than as the number of men in an army, say, or the bodies of the dead when a city was sacked or stricken with plague. The Bible speaks of three score years and ten, but this must have seemed as mythical as the 969 years ascribed to Methuselah in the book of Genesis. We know a bit more about the age of kings and clergymen, but not much. Those who survive battle or the treatment of their wounds by doctors might reach 50, like King Alfred the Great. Some high clergy made it to 70, not many. Consequently, people married much earlier, 
and though there was no formal age of consent, 12 seems to have been the age at which a marriage might be consummated, though it could be contracted much earlier. Indeed, the age of consent set at 16 in Britain was not, I think, established by law until 1885. Knowledge about the mass of the people is not gathered until the later 18th century. This intensified in the West as political events of the century and its successors the 20th century unfolded. The early years among the elite, a growing knowledge of the nameless masses was due to the work of private individuals and charitable organizations, mostly based on religious tenets. Opposition to the lucrative slave trade also emerged at this time. The camera and then the newsreel made an immediate impact. Newspapers in Britain started printing pictures in the 1890s and television made the greatest impression of all after the Second World War. There was also a growing sense among the privileged, never completely absent in times past, that all human life was important. The Poor Law, initiated in the late years of the first Queen Elizabeth, although hardly intended, went some way to replacing the medieval pastoral care of the Catholic Church, nationalized in the 1530s by King Henry VIII, whose officials dissolved the monasteries. We the people made our biggest impact through the extension of the right to vote for parliaments and assemblies of leading Western countries, Britain, the United States, France, Germany, Italy. By the early 20th century, government needed to know more and more about us common people because as voters, we made demands on the state to which rulers had to respond or lose the next election. Governments also needed to know about the masses because many people, unconsidered hitherto, became income tax and rate payers for the first time during the last years of the 19th century, as we remain, supplying most of the financial needs of government. Now the masses cannot be ignored. Time only started to be important in daily affairs of most people towards the end of the 18th century, with the introduction of the division of labor in industrial practices, the production line, and the shift system, which required punctuality and clocking on. By the 1850s, the need for railway timetables completed the timekeeping straitjacket. If our ancient ancestors could not count the years of their own birthdays, was there any conception of time in the much broader context? The Roman Empire took its year dates from the legendary foundation of Rome by Romulus and Remus in the 8th century BC, but the years were probably of little interest outside aristocratic and educated circles. The annual calendar became important because it marked festivals and feasts when there might be free food, wine, games. For the political minority, it was crucial to know the length of terms of office for appointees of the state. Two of our months are still named after Roman rulers, July commemorating Julius Caesar and August the Emperor Augustus. The church required to know the hours of the day because the offices had to be called usually by the tolling of a bell for the different religious services. The tradition is maintained in many Anglican churches whose bell ringing has still summoned the faithful to prayer or to mark the sacrament of marriage. The church had sundials, but candle clocks in our period were the most useful. A candle was marked off by the hour as it burned down, and provided it was protected from drafts, it was fairly efficient. A conception of time learned naturally by everyone in any agrarian society would have been the seasons of the year, an intuitive knowledge that must surely go back to the mists of prehistory. Most people probably did not know how old they were. The idea that a year had a number was not thought of even in the writings of some of the educated in Britain, such as the early priestly chroniclers, or other writers in the centuries after the fall of Rome in what we know as the fifth century. The only reason we call it the 5th century, and our present century the 21st, is because of some little-known Greek theologian, Dionysius Exiguus, in what we call the 6th century. He devised a method of dating the years and centuries from the birth of Jesus Christ, which he called Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, the first year being one, of course, then two, three, five hundred, and so on. We shorten this to AD and use AD before the numbers to differentiate them from BC, before Christ, devised by St. Bede at a monastery in Northumbria.
Recently, some educated folk, strident atheists perhaps, secularists, the politically correct, ignoring familiarity and habit, now call ADCE, meaning Common Era. BC, by this reckoning, is now called BCE, before Common Era. The Islamic year is 1433, used on many coins in Muslim countries, based on the date that the Prophet Muhammad fled Mecca. There are other dating systems. In practice, the rest of the world now uses AD-BC dating system contingently. In fact, Dionysius Exiguus got it wrong. It's now generally agreed that Christ was born in 4 BC. But whether he got it wrong or not, year 1 CE is still seen as the birth of Christ by people of every religion or no religion at all. Whichever way I look at it, it is just plain daft to change terms we all take for granted, at least for now. No doubt I shall receive emails about this. We left Doomsday Book in the last episode, when, if not a landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow and plough, as described in a poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins, the English countryside was ordered, calculated, Mrs Cox tells us, not in feet and yards, much less in metres and centimetres, for which we may thank or excoriate Napoleon Bonaparte, who introduced metric measurement, but in ploughlands, units of land that could be ploughed by a team of oxen in a season. Woodland was often measured in the number of pigs it could support. Rents could be paid in money, but most likely in kind. Mrs Cox mentions a rental of a bundle of eels on Palm Sunday, but the rents varied from place to place, depending on what was grown or reared and whether cash was available. You will see in the illustrations we are using how a plough and other farm implements looked and how people dressed. No tights like Errol Flynn in Hollywood historical epics, but thick leggings and heavy overgarments. The peasantry would have appeared very grey or brown, sombre. The early Anglo-Saxon warlords would have worn some form of armour on their bodies and heads, mostly made of leather. Later, we shall see some of the bodily accoutrements from gold and silver hordes and hear of the magnificence of kings. You will also note from the pictures we shall be looking at how scrawny the animals and poultry were. Ears of corn were similarly thin, since cross-fertilization of cereals and the breeding of animals were unknown scientifically until the 18th century, though evidently inadvertently practiced long before. There were wind and water mills. Outside the remaining Roman roads, the local roads were as dry as dust in summer and became swamps in winter. This did not begin to change until the 19th century with the application of tar macadam, tarmac, invented by John Macadam, a Scotsman. In rural areas today, the actual layout of the roads and the land and some buildings is not very different from more than a thousand years ago. Tracks or lanes might well have been established in the prehistoric period and followed except for their main roads by Romans, Anglo-Saxons and everyone else since, including the local highway authorities which have tended to lay down metal surfaces on previously unmade tracks. Roads were, as they still are, determined by terrain, rivers and streams by sharp escarpments. Many medieval bridges remain and were wooden in the Anglo-Saxon times before they were built in stone, most famously London Bridge which was not built on stone piers until the reign of King John at the beginning of the 13th century. If water were shallow enough, a river or a stream bed might serve as a ford. Many fords survive today. Even if only made of wood for most of the Anglo-Saxon period, village churches were gradually replaced by stone ones by the Norman or Plantagenet Lord of the Manor as his contribution to the church and the redemption of his own and his family's souls. Kings, great churchmen and noblemen, of course, built cathedrals and abbeys of stone or beautified existing ones. The Anglo-Saxon hall of wood often became the Norman manor house, many of which were later built of brick or stone as the country became richer. They frequently stand on the same spot as, or very close to, the Anglo-Saxon dwelling, as Tony Robinson's time team archaeology program has shown us. Manorial and parish boundaries into the tw this 21st century are mostly much more ancient than people realise, 
and have been determined by manorial boundaries, watercourses, terrain and locally important buildings for hundreds of years. We are enmeshed in the history of geography. Most houses, even many castles, palaces and churches were built of wood under the Anglo-Saxon monarchies, although the Normans would change that with their cathedral and castle building ambitions. Our heritage of church buildings, the length and breadth of Britain, is wondrous. A testament not only to the wealth of England in particular, but to the devotion to Christianity and its promise of redemption among all ranks of folk from the king down. We also have the ruins of monasteries and other foundations despoiled by the religious reformation in England and Wales and then Scotland in the 16th century, when popes were sacked in this island at the edge of the world. Is there any ruin more heartbreakingly beautiful than Fountains Abbey, Yorkshire? This is the end of the second episode. In the next, we shall be setting the scene for the Roman Empire, of which the province of Britannia was part for nearly 350 years. The impact of Rome on our society today still resonates. <laughs>